What is up, everybody? It's Dr. Vibe here, host and producer of the award-winning The Dr. Vibe Show. I have hosted and produced over 2,000 epic conversations over the last 10 years. And what makes our conversations epic? We don't do interviews. We do conversations. What is up, everybody? It's Dr. Vibe here, host and producer of the award-winning Dr. Vibe Show. As always, I like to say you're blessed, highly favored, a magnet for miracles, and a solution for someone's problem. Also know I'm a certified empowerment coach and president and CEO of Express Your Vibe Coaching and Communications. And as always, the Dr. Vibe Show is the home of Epic Conversations, and I am the host of Epic Conversations. And you know I always love to have new friends on the Dr. Vibe Show for you for people who watch and support. So it took some time, but I have another new friend on the Dr. Vibe show. And once I read a little bit about her, you'll find out why it took some time to get her on the Dr. Vibe show. Our new friend is Janice Robinson Celeste. She's a businesswoman, journalist, author, entrepreneur, mother, grandmother, and is one of the original founders of Successful Black Parenting Magazine. Right there, you can tell I'm just wiping my brow. That so that's why, but we'll get some more in. That's one of the reasons why she's so hard to get on a, on a show. She is also a contributing writer for Huffington Post, is a published author of two parenting books, Pride and Joy by Simon & Schuster, and Making a Supermodel, a Parent's Guide. She has a degree in early childhood education and holds a master's degree in business. Wow. Formerly the school age child care SACC coordinator for the Philadelphia area with the nonprofit organization Parents Union for Public Schools. She developed SACC programs throughout the city. She headed a $2 million YMCA where she served as the executive branch director in charge of operations for a new facility, including the NA. EYC accredited child care program and summer camp. In addition, she, has, she held the title of early childhood specialist at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia's child at Phil, of Philadelphia's child guidance center, where she worked with parents who struggled with substance abuse challenges to guide them with healthy develop of the healthy development of young children. She also was a preschool teacher and has taught children through high school. So, you know, you can tell already, people who are watching this live on the replay, we could talk for seven days about <laughs> all the things she's done. Here's another thing, and you, and if you're watching, you know this is a no-brainer. At the age of 49, she held the title of Mrs. New Jersey, United States 2015, and still competes in pageants to this day. No surprise, and that's a compliment. Thank you. She is the mother of three successful adult daughters, including international supermodel Cecily Lopez. She's here with us tonight. We chose one thing to talk about, so hopefully she'll come back and talk about some other things <laughs> about Successful Black Parenting Magazine. So welcome for the first time, and hopefully not the last time, Ms. Janice Robinson Celeste. How are you? I am doing just great. I'm so happy to be here with you. Yes, it took some time. Yes, but, you know, it's just good as any time, as, as now as any other time. So we're doing really well, so I'm just happy to see you. <laughs> Excellent. And I, in our pre-chat, I didn't get a chance to ask, what city are you based in? I am in Florida, north of Daytona. Okay, okay, because when I was reading, I'm going Philadelphia. There have been more people from Philadelphia, either living or from mm -hmm. there, on the Dr. Vibe show than any other city. Hey, we breed a lot of successful people out no, of that city. I'm, I can I'm tell very, you. Uh, that's true. <laughs> no, it's very, very true. I, I, I receive that. That is so, so true. That Philadelphia, and I've got to get back there. And what I actually um, on once a week on WURD out of Philadelphia. So the Philadelphia is definitely part of Doctor Vibe's heart. So, like we always like to do, the first time we have a new friend on the Doctor Vibe show, can you share some background? You know where you grew up life as a younger Janice, etc. <laughs> okay, well, that's a long story. You know, that's like 51 years in the making. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, what's interesting? You are, you're not shy to share your age. And uh, two, okay. thing, two things my mother told me with ladies, don't talk about their age and don't talk about their weight. So I'm letting you handle that. Well, thank you. No, I don't, I don't, just, hey, I'm proud to be 51 years old and have, I'm proud to be a grandmother. My kids asked me when my granddaughters were born, what do you want them to call you? And I said, just call me grandma. I don't mind. Actually, they're the only ones can do that. And 
their voices when they call me, it's just like heaven. I mean, you know, I, they were staying over one day and uh, uh, my oldest granddaughter, grandma, and it was just like angels singing to me. I just love hearing her and I don't mind being a grandma. This is a whole other stage. This is the second, um, my second coming basically where I'm doing for me. So yes, where was I born? So I was born in Philadelphia, raised in Philadelphia. I always go, West Philadelphia, born and raised on the playground is where I spent all of my <laughs> days. So just like Will Smith and not far from Will Smith. He grew up in Overbrook. I grew up in right, yes. right near Overbrook. Yeah. Um, I didn't know Will Smith. I met him later in life by chance at a premiere and got a kiss from him on the cheek when he found out that I was from West Philadelphia. So um, I'll never forget that. He made my millennium with that. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry, Jada, but I was really happy that. Oh day. my! Oh. I, I, easy now, easy now. Here you go. Loved it. It was great because I, you know, I, I'm always cheering for people from home. So if you come from Philadelphia and you're making it, I'm really happy for you. I'm the type of person. I'm your biggest cheerleader. I'll never ever be like, how come they made it? You know, I want to make sure that you know everybody makes it. I think it's enough to go around for everybody. So I grew up there. Um, as an adult, I moved my kids on the, our neighborhood started going down a little bit in West Philadelphia. I noticed a lot of, of renters came in and just went downhill. Um, drugs came into the neighborhood more and more and there was a lot of shootings and I had, you know, young children. So, um, you know, I had a, a daycare center before that, um, that I ran out of my home and that's how I got started in early childhood. And I did that so that I could be home with my children. Uh, I remember going around looking at other daycare centers to, to place my children and I'm sitting there observing and things were going on that I wasn't happy with uh, yelling at children, roughing up children. And I was like, how are you going to just yank him out the chair? How are you going to yell at him? Like, I'm watching you. <laughs> what are you going to do when I'm not watching you? So I, I, there was only one daycare center that I could afford at the time because I was a single mom. And yes, single moms can raise successful children. Yes. And just a little caveat on the side. For all the people who want to stereotype single moms that the, the ap fathers are absent, let me tell you something right now. A lot of times single moms choose not to have the man in their life on purpose and they can raise their children successfully. Now, I don't advocate that's the way it should always be, but if that's the case, you don't always need to assume people out there and they know who they are that, um, oh, the black woman was left by herself because the man left. No, that don't always happen that way. I just want to make sure that's clear. It's, it's always two sides to every story. And what you see and think you know, you might not. So, Absolutely. in addition, <laughs> so no, anyway, good. I raised Important. my children. And yes, I'm the one who walked away twice. I was married twice at that time. So I left. Um, uh, it just didn't work out for me. I'm very independent, too. So as you can probably see. Yes, by your, by your bio. <laughs> yes, I can tell by your bio. Very independent. So, you know, I always had this um, mantra about me that I could do bad by myself. So I'm sorry if anybody feels bad about that, but that's how I've always been. I've been like, I, if you, you're not going to help me, I can do bad by myself. Um, and some people might say, oh, that's selfish. Well, no, I just need you to help me. <laughs> that's all it comes down to. And if you can't do that, you got to go bye-bye. So um, raised my kids there. And then uh, when I noticed, it was one day I woke up. I just let them walk to the bus stop. They were 10, 8, and 6, and they would take care of each other. And um, uh, the bus stop was right outside our house, but I heard gunshots. And I was not sure if my children had made it to the bus stop or not, and it just made my heart drop. And I said, that's it. And I, I sat there and I prayed. I said, God, if there's any way you can get me out of this, this particular neighborhood, please do. I just started the magazine in print at that time. That was in the 90s. And a book deal came along that same week. So that's how I got to the deal with Simon and Schuster, and I did use the royalty money to get me a house in Florida. I always loved Florida, um, especially Southwest Florida. It's my favorite place to be, um, but uh, that's where I always wanted to go. So that's what we did. We moved down there, um, and then my well, my oldest, my youngest daughter, sorry, got a modeling contract. Uh, we moved back up north. Yeah, I didn't want to. <laughs> But I couldn't resist. It was like an offer we couldn't refuse. She was with IMG Models, who had all the Victoria's Secrets models. Um, they had Tyra Banks at the time. Uh, she had gotten picked by three different agencies, and that was one, and they were the biggest. So we went with them. She hit the ground running modeling, and she was only 13, just barely 13 years old. How old? 13 when it all started. Um, my okay, smart well, hold, hold on. You know you have to do a part two because what you've just shared is about three three conversations worth already. Right. But I'll let you go on. 
I've done a lot. Like when I look back, I was like, heart is almost unbelievable. I'm like, God. And then I, I get tired thinking about it. <laughs> There's a lot going on there. Um, but yeah, so uh, she was one, up one out of two people picked for an open call for IMG models that wow. day. And um, by that time, I had already been, you know, divorced. I had been seeing somebody, and I was in a verbally abusive relationship. Oh and gosh. once again, I was like, God, if it, you know, if this happens, I'm never going back to this person. And that's what happened. So wow. God was made it happen. So because for her to be picked, and it was only two that entire year picked, it was a miracle. And especially with her being a black girl, this is not a black agency. Um, and just so happened, we met the most wonderful agent. And he's still a family friend today, um, even though she's not with that agency anymore. Right. So he will mm-hmm. always be family. And uh, he actually put her in a movie, which is on Netflix right now. I'm going to plug it real quick. It's, it's called Supermodel. <laughs> she is starring in a movie. Just know that the mom in that movie is not me. <laughs> they, <laughs> everything else is kind of like her life. It's very similar because most models' lives are very similar. But the mom was, I think she's a drug addict. Yeah. And she's like, no, that is, and no, a former model. Well, I am a former model. I did some things. But that's not me. It's not her life completely. It's got a lot of, you know, it wasn't based on her life. It was based on his cousin's life, which is very similar to what Cecily went through. Um, so I just gotta put that little disclaimer out there. Don't don't get it get, get it confused. Right. Um, so so yeah, I've done I did that, and then um, we stay we st- had stopped the magazine uh, by the time I moved to Florida because basically when we started it up, my partner and I who we met at work, uh, we did it for five years, and what happened was we we didn't know how to run a magazine at that time. We learned a lot though. I gotta tell you, and. Um, one of the hardest lessons learned was how to get advertisers for the magazine. I mean, big advertisers. So we financed it in the beginning ourselves. I put my, I had a rental property I put up, um, you know, and got a loan for. I had um, credit cards. We both maxed out. We did it the hard way. We put our own money in it, you know. So that's how we lasted five years. But we had just enough money to fail. You need, uh, we figured out we needed a million dollar budget. We had about $30,000 budget. To do this thing. Yeah. And that was for five years. So what happens when you do a magazine that's new, advertisers will sit on the fence, right? They want to see if you're going to make it or whatever. And if you make it past the first two years, they'll, they'll join you. Our advertisers did join us. We had Kellogg, State Farm. Um, we had uh, Allstate Insurance. We had Clorox. We had all these major brands behind us, Lever Brothers, but they came on too late. And we really needed them to come on right away. Um, I depended on too many people. The first I thought, oh, well, I can call them from my Philadelphia office and try to get them in. That didn't work. Then I depended on a um, advertising sales agency to do it for me. They had other magazines under you know, their hat. So they were putting the bigger magazines before us. Um, I realized that and I went out and started selling it myself. And I got every single ad in that book. I got the Lever Brothers, Clorox, the Allstate, the, um, company, every, all the big major Fortune 500 advertisers I was able to get, but it was too late. Um, by the time they did come on board, uh, we had to, to keep printing. We also had some competition who was very unscrupulous that was trying to hurt us and we didn't have proper um, attorney representation, which is very important to have, they say, always have a good attorney and a good accountant. Uh, we were we were struggling, so we couldn't afford to retain an t- attorney. We couldn't afford um, even an accountant at the time, So because we, we were doing everything basically ourselves uh, with stuff for the printer and the mailing house. Um, So we had a lot of uh, hard knocks, a lot of learning. Um, Damon John's always, he's always says, Damon John says that you you basically learn through failure. You learn through um, being poor. So we learned a lot, but we, our circulation was amazing. We were able to still build our circulation up, which attracted those advertisers. And we had a hundred thousand circulation. We started with 30 because we did a lot of free circulation in the neighborhood. So um, because of that, that's what got in this path, something called path long circulation. You see, I learned a lot, right? So here we are 20 something years later. Wow. I decide, well, we missed it. You know, it was like we lost a family member when we shut it down. And my partner and I would talk and talk and we'd be like, oh, I wish we could do this, which we had what we have today. Because you got to think now, the internet was just in its infancy for the public back then. And it was just AOL was how you got your mail. Yep, yep. Um, you would load a web page and you could go get a sandwich, make it, come back, start eating it. And it just, it's start, just starting to load. You know, that's how long it took to get a web page up. So we were just two women from West Philadelphia. We had no connections. 
We didn't know any investors. Venture capitalists were going just for tech companies. Um, so we just we just kept trying and trying, and we kept saying we were like fleas holding on to a bucking bull. The public supported us. We won all kinds of awards. We had top scientists and research people on our advisory board. Everybody at the time, Alvin Poussant was one of the biggest. For, he used to um, he was on our board. Harriet McAdoo. We had all these wonderful people supporting us. We won a publishing award. Um, we won a lot of different things. But like I said, it was at the end. So I knew it was a good thing. I knew we were on the right track. I just needed to have uh, enough money or someone to invest that actually had the money we needed. We knew we needed at least a million dollars to get this thing right and have the employees that we want and everything. I don't have a million dollars. I still don't have a million dollars. <laughs> but, you know, and I, I didn't know anybody with a million dollars at that time. So, you know, I did what I could. Um, here we are, like I said, 23 years later, we're talking on the phone. And I said, hey, you know what? Her name is Marta. I said, Marta, I have acquired so many skills since we shut down the magazine. I know Photoshop. I learned, I know photography. I know videography. I said, I know um, design. Uh, I'm a writer now. I wasn't a writer back then. I was just starting to develop my skills back then. I said, um, I can do almost this whole magazine by myself. I can do websites. I can do everything. So I said, you know what? Let me just throw up a website See if it gets any attention, any attraction. I said, I'll put, you know, I'll put some articles up. I'll write them myself, whatever I got to do. Let's put them up and let's just see what we can do. And we start planning out and we said, if we put it up, we don't want it to be like a blog. We wanted to kind of be a hybrid of a blog and a magazine. Like literally, I told her, I said, I want to do even a magazine cover for each month because I want that magazine feel to it. You know, I don't want it to be just a blog. I need, I want to have parent interaction, etc. So that's what we did. And I said, okay, so phase one, which we're in right now is to build our following. We need the community behind us. So we're trying to build our following because that's what advertisers are going to see. And that's what um, pays for a magazine. You know, it's nice to have subscribers. They're almost like a bonus when you have actually a print magazine, but the advertisers are, are your bread and butter. So we want to start before before we go to print because we are going to still try to go to print again. That's the whole thing. Even though people say print is dead and, um, you know, it's not really because the way we did it is not dead. It's not dead. I'm not trying to sell newsstand uh, copies. I'm not, you know, anybody wants to subscribe would be a bonus for us. And we, we're happy to have them and I'm um, excited actually having they somebody subscribe. I get I get really happy, <laughs> but the money is going to come from the advertisers. So. We want to make sure we um, get the magazine into the hands of the people um, with free circulation. We have we had even talked about going the profit route. I'm not sure that's what I want to do. I really want it to be as big as any other um, corporate magazine like Parents, Parenting, Time Magazine, that, that kind of thing, you know. Um, and then maybe soon we'll come out with it. If we can get that to happen, maybe soon after we can do a different magazine that I have in mind that's very similar. But... Um, but not quite the same. <laughs> I won't tell you about that yet. But yeah, I'm trying, you know, I really want to see this, I call it my baby, just walk and then run. Um, it makes me happy doing this. This is my calling. I'm the happiest when I'm working on this publication. And, uh, you know, you have to find your joy in life, right? Yeah. <laughs> this is my joy. I agree. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have enough time to do all this, but I'm going to start looking at different things and just having you share. Mm -hmm. In the early days, what kept you and your partner going? We knew it was a good thing. Um, when we first looked at parenting magazines in the 90s, we actually bought like 60 different magazines. Um, and we went back and looked at all the covers for the whole year. And we saw that there was only one um, black child in the cover. And it was questionable if they were black. Um, so we said to each other, what we wanted was when you have these magazines on your coffee table and your little toddlers toddling around, that they can see images from that young even of themselves or somebody that looks like them on that magazine cover because we're not represented in the media like we should be. Um, I'm hoping that we're having a change now in that 
and that you see more and more people of color. I know it started happening in the fashion industry because I know that as an industry pretty well. And now I'm hoping that it ha it's happening in Hollywood. I'm hoping it's happening with commercials. And I'm not talking tokenism because I can't stand tokenism. <laughs> I just talked to someone about that today with an ad for my magazine. I said, why is there only one black kid on this infographic and he's at the bottom and you want me to put this in my publication? How about we have more diversity on it? I don't mind diversity, but I need to see that it's not just one token. Um, black kid, if you want to put in my public, I'm so I'm the protective mom of this magazine. I don't put anything in there that I, I don't think is um, good for my my um, readers. Like uh, I've had a lot of people um, that aren't African American or not, and I say African Americans, it's really black because I want it to be universal. Like so, it can be um, Jamaicans, it can be um, people from Dominican, it can be anybody anywhere in the UK that rep that identifies with having ancestors that were maybe slaves, you know, or even not slaves. You know, we have people still in Africa who never had that experience in their family. So, but, if, you know, I know there's different cultures all within all of us, but I want you, if you identify with some of the things that we're going through, I want you to be my reader. So that's why we didn't call it African-American parenting or anything like that. Okay. And a lot of people are afraid of that word black. You'd be surprised. They're like, why black? Why not? Why are you going to be separate? I'm like, I'm not. I said, first of all, if you look around, the world is separate. <laughs> Besides that, you have men magazines, women magazines. You have magazines for people who are um, Latina, you know, yeah. um, and it's in English. So you can't tell me it's because they speak another language. So don't even try that. So and I'm like, so we are. But that doesn't mean it's bad. You know, you Everybody has their own culture. And I think it's black today. We took a word that was supposed to be negative for us and we turned it into something positive. And I think people can't stand that sometimes because we made it a culture instead of about skin color. Because, you know, we come in all hues. So it's, we're not just black. We're in all hues of different colors of beautiful brown. And the black means culture. It's our culture that we have similar to one another, the experiences that we have. Because especially for um, people who are American, African-Americans, that parents uh, or ancestors, their parents, but their ancestors um, might have been involved with slave trade. We lost that tradition, so we made our own traditions up. So that's a whole culture within itself. And if they can, if anybody else can have Italian um, clubs and uh, Irish this and that, that's great. I think we should celebrate each other culture, understand that we are different, and it's okay. Let Let me ask. You, and if, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm listening attentively here. Mm -hmm. You had started the magazine and then you stopped it. Yes, we did. We stopped it and, we, for five years. I mean, we went for five years. How, what made you start it again and how difficult was it to start it again? It wasn't difficult at all because it's only online right now. We're going to do the print. We're working toward phase three is to go back to print. So we have not gone back to print. I had all the skills built in to do this and to bring it back. Um, I think it took me one day to put the website up, and I've been um, working with it since. Uh, but then we went and I did social media the next day and just started adding rich content to it. And when you love something, it you tend to work on it all night, all day. You know, <laughs> and that's what I did. So let me I, when I, when I'm listening to you, and I'm I'm sure the audience is listening to you. Where do you get, and I say this word in a positive manner, your tenacity from? That's a good question. That's a good question. I gotta tell you, sometimes it feels like, you know, I'll, not with the magazine so much, but, you know, sometimes it feels like I reached for the brass ring so many times and missed, and I'm like, I haven't grabbed it yet. I still haven't grabbed it. So I'm like, sometimes I just be like, well, geez, why, am I, why do I keep trying? And, you know, I can't tell you where that tenacity comes from, but I know this is a good thing. So maybe that's what drives me. Maybe that's the fuel, but I know this is a good thing and I'm proud of it. And um, I, I see, you know, where it can go and I see what it can, I know what it can do for young children, even just looking at the images. And I, one of the things that drives me now being a former teacher is that the ages, especially, and I'm not, people say from one to three, but it's from in the womb to it may be age three. You know, the brain is developing so much that what the things we provide in this magazine for parents will help their children to be almost 
genius. I can't guarantee that, but excellent. They will be excellent at school because they need to read. They need to have books. They need to have all these types of stimulations at this age group so they can do well in school. So we don't have this black achievement gap that I keep hearing about in schools where, you know, the testing scores are so far apart. Testing is a whole other subject. I, I have, I'm totally against testing, but we won't go there. <laughs> but you we'll know, say that we'll say that for another conversation. Yeah, I do not like standardized testing. I don't think everyone learns the same way. It's just a whole conversation I can go in on a tangent about. So, um, but you have this whole. This is the schools are freaking out now because they their funding is tied to it now. And they're like, oh, the black achievement gap. Why aren't the black kids doing better? Well, what's wrong with the black kids? There's nothing wrong with the black kids. It's, 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 okay, so this is what I say about that. And I'll leave this. If you have a teacher that teaches and everybody fails the test consistently year after year after year, is it the kid's fault or the teacher's fault? It's the same thing with the system. If you're having problems with so many kids not doing well in this test, it's obviously not the kids. So that's I'll leave that at that. I'm very passionate about that, and I hate standardized tests myself. So, <laughs> oh, boy, I, I, I'm, I'm already, I'm already, I'm already saving that in my mind. I'm already envisioning you on another conversation, chatting about that with one of the members of my community who's a, uh, he's been an educator for like 25, 30 years. So I'm okay. already envisioning that conversation because he, <laughs> he will agree with you. Um, I want to get back to this tenacity piece and related this. Did you maybe get any of it from either of your parents? No, you know what. Wow. My parents, I, I was always an entrepreneur, right? So right. seven, I, uh, I started the lemonade stand like most kids. But when I, I got really kind of hurt personally that no one was coming to my lemonade stand in front of my house in West Philadelphia. So I, I, got, I was sitting there going, now, seven years old, where are the thirsty people? And I realized there's a basketball court right as a church next to our house, right next to our church. I'm going to put all my stuff in my wagon and I'm going to sell it to them <laughs> at the basketball court. So I did that. And um, my mom was looking for me. I come back. I had a bunch of money. So then I decided to go to um, there's another bigger basketball court across the street. So I had to cross two streets to get there at the playground. Um, Haddington's play playground. So anybody know that in West Philadelphia? That's playground. I pulled my wagon over there. There were some rougher guys over there, though. So, but sold out again. So my mom was like, where are you selling all this lemonade? <laughs> and so I told her, and then she got afraid for me because she knew they were a little rough over there. And I had like a big wad of money because I had one of those big cup thingies. And then I had, I, I was charging a dollar cup back then. So the people were buying it. I don't know if they were doing it just because I was this little girl or not, but um, I had a big roll of money and she was afraid somebody would hurt me and take it. So she would, she forbid me from going over to sleep. She said, can't go over there for basic. No, I'm not, you can't go. So um, I ended up having to close my lemonade stand because <laughs> she was too afraid for me. But then around 11, I started, um, there was some older people who lived on, around the corner. I started sweeping leaves off their sidewalks. I would remove their snow. Uh, I remember I was always, always look younger than what I was. So when I was 11, they thought I was like seven and I was, I had to tell them, no, I'm 11. And then I did that till I was about 16, got to know them. And would visit them, and they were older people, so they were really happy that I came to visit them. I think I, some of them, I reminded them of their grandchild, but they would pay me. And so I always did this, And my, but my parents, my father was a mechanic for SEPTA, which is the um, bus system in Philadelphia. He was the head mechanic there until he died. And then my, my mother was the secretary of the school that I went to at Our Lady Victory. Um, when she, she wasn't home before that she was home because she, my brother was on special ed. So she took care of him, but then got him into school. Uh, so yeah, so yeah, that's none of them. And I, they would say to me, when are you going to get a real job? When I start my daycare center and, you know, did all that stuff. They were like, <laughs> they were used to get, working for somebody and getting, a, getting a check and retirement and all that. And I, I told her, I said, you know, I really love working for myself. I, I, I'm going to say it's probably my grandfather who I never met. He had his own barbershop. He's the only entrepreneur I know in the family so that I know of, I should say. I never met him. He died before I was born. So it, why start, and I'm not saying in a bad way, no, why start a magazine about specifically black parenting? 
was that just a natural from you, for you based on your daycare experience, educational experience, or did were there other choices that you could have made yeah, other than there were other parenting? choices. Of, of course, I know that best being a black parent, but there were other choices. And of course, I dealt with black parents with my daycare center. But when I worked for Philadelphia Child Guidance Center, which is part of Children's Hospital, it was at the time anyway. Um, we had substance abusing parents in West Philadelphia, and most of those parents were African American. So I would, uh, I was the early childhood specialist. So I would uh, present like articles that I pulled out of Parents Magazine and Parenting Magazine, and I would say, okay, we're going to talk about this today. And they would look at the article, throw it on the table, and say, um, you know, we don't parent like this. And I knew exactly what they meant. Uh, it's a cultural difference. I knew exactly what they meant. That's why when people say, oh, aren't we all the same? I'm like, no, we're not. and don't want to be. <laughs> we don't want to be the same. I don't. I want, I want equity. Yep. Yeah. But I don't want to be like you. I like me and I like my culture. And I think we should be able to celebrate each other's cultures. I always say that. But yeah, so that's what happened. So I started writing my own articles for these parents. And I had so many... I went to my uh, co-worker who I befriended there and I said, you know, and she was a social worker there. I said, I have so many articles. I would love to see these published. You know, I could probably do a magazine just nonchalantly like that. I said, I put these together, have a magazine. Didn't really mean it. <laughs> and she said, well, why don't we do it? And I was like, yeah, why don't we? Not all, you know, naive, not knowing what we were getting into because it was a lot. And I would still do it again, but it was a lot to learn. So we said it was like we were walking around in a dark room trying to find a light switch. And we finally found it and was able to publish the magazine. Uh, we did a lot of research before we actually published and went to different publishers of smaller pub magazines. We even went to Essence, Essence Magazine, who I love. But at the time, Robert Johnson offered me a job instead of offering to help us. Oh, wow. <laughs> he offered me a job because he loved my tenacity. He loved my personality. Thank you. I'm, not, I'm not, not alone. Robert Thank Johnson. you. I, know. I didn't want to work for Robert Johnson. He was a sweet man, and I'll tell him that to this day. But I need. I wanted to see my, my baby fly. I really wanted to see that. So it was nice meeting him. We went to New York for that. And, um, uh, he's, of course, he's not there anymore. But, yeah, he wanted to hire me when I wanted to him to um, take this publication under his arm. So you can see we did a lot to try to make this thing fly. We just weren't meeting the right people, I think, at the time. Well, every, I believe that most things have a birth, death, and resurrection. Okay. So, well, I can see that. That's where we are. The, exactly. You're the let phoenix. Me, <laughs> let me, yeah, you're the phoenix. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Compared to when you started the magazine to where we are at now with black parenting. How are the challenges same or different over those period of years? Are they the same when you started compared to what they are now? No, the difference is really social media. I think that's the biggest difference. Um, we had people ask us all the time, um, but it wasn't, you know, we would find them far and few between, but why a black parenting magazine? And, you know, you get tired of explaining yourself, really. You're like, can you just go read the about me section <laughs> now, you know? Um, and before, we didn't even have a website because it was so new. Uh, so we even having a website now is different from back then. Uh, we had, like, a presence, like a page where you can find out to, how to subscribe. But it was really really wasn't a website. Um, it, it was, that was, people didn't know really how to do that yet. And um, so that in social media, people are so vocal. Um, I have, I'm very friendly with the block button and the mute block because I get a lot of races, um, that are really mean and, um, they're just mean people. I'm going to tell them they're mean people. Yes, you're mean people. Um, and it's, it's just not nice. And they really, I pray for them <laughs> because, you know, we're, we, yes, we are all people, but we all have different experiences. We all have, um, you know, different lives and where you come from. And I don't know, but it's, it's just, I have to block some people because, um, the, the, what comes across is just so horrible sometimes. Um, so I will protect my readers. I will protect my, my publication. I don't want any negativity there. I don't mind if you have a different opinion, but if you're going to spew hate, and you're not. I'm going to hit blockity block, block, block. <laughs> That's how it's going to go. <laughs> Understood. Uh, 
So as we sit today on January 24th, 2018, you said social media is a big challenge. What yes. are black parents telling you either face-to-face -face or online some of the challenges that they're facing in today's society? Um, one of the things that uh, interests me recently, just last week, a, a parent wanted to subscribe. So I get a lot of people saying, how can I subscribe to the print, print, print? And I'm like, just stay tuned. <laughs> We're coming. But she said what interests her, this one particular one stood out, was that how to uh, improve the, her son's reading skills. And she's interested in anything about black boys. Now, um, my experience, I had all girls. I have all granddaughters. So I really, when someone writes something about boys, I kind of attach to it. So if you're a writer and your mom um, and you want to talk about your your son, I'm going to um, latch on to that because my experience, I have no boys. Uh, we're girl dominated family. So if you see, like, I don't want it to be all girl dominated. So I definitely want to have more um, information about black boys and their how to improve reading skills in black boys, especially because that seems to be an issue. And the opposite with girls, like I want the science and the math and all the STEM stuff for the girls to help promote them to be in industries with um, technology and engineering. Uh, so I'm very I love the black girls code um, movement that they're doing. Uh, I would love to work with them even more. So that's that's what I see. I think that's what we need more of. Okay, fair enough. Uh, how many people are helping you outside of just you two? Well, that's a good thing. We have we have readers who volunteer. I mean, readers, writers who volunteer um, because right now, like, we don't have we don't have a real budget. Like, I, I I'm a school teacher. I do this on my salary right now. Um, I don't want to get. Um, I just started adding affiliate advertising to our site, um, and you know how hard that is to even make money on. Um, everything pretty much is paid for by me, and right now I can handle that. Um, I do eventually want to get um, larger advertisers and go see them and talk to them um, once I've built my following even further. So, um, you know, basically, I do a lot. I'm a one-man man. Whenever I'm not working full-time, I tell everybody I have two jobs. So um, I'm up to midnight sometimes working on this. Uh, weekends. I have it planned out. I know what articles are coming up. Um, I will research and see who I can contact uh, to get articles. Um, you know, uh, there's other organizations you can put out and, and say, hey, I need an expert in this and an expert in that. There's some that I've actually discriminated. Remember I told you people don't like the name black in there, the word black in the name, I should say. And um, I believe a lot of times when I try to get help from some people, um, and you know, there's a lot of people out there right now with this whole new climate that we're dealing with in, in America that are uh, very, very racist. <laughs> so I, the first thing that's going to come to my mind, if you give me a hard time when I never had a hard time before, and I'm not going to mention the name of the company to try to get resources, and this, you give me a hard time suddenly, and then I go back and see even smaller publications that you've helped, and you tell me it's because of my Alexa rating. Um, I had this happen. They couldn't help me because of my Alexa. They said my Alexa rating was high enough. And I said, that's how you judge like how many people come to your site through your Alexa rating. I went back and I was like, okay, that's cool. But when I did articles for the Huffington Post, you helped me. So I said, and it could be the same articles that I'm doing, but because I have black in my name, I think it was the issue. And so then um, I go back and I see the other blogs listed. They're way smaller than our publication. So um, we get discriminated against because of that. And I don't, I'm ready for it. I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready. I'll find a way around it. I will. But, <laughs> but. Um, I've got, had to deal with that too, so it's been a little bit frustrating. But it's only it's basically me doing everything, wow. and uh, I do the I do the best I can what I got, and I use my writers um, who volunteer to um, help make this publication what it is. Well, congratulations on all Just the work thanks, you've been doing. It's <laughs> a one lady one lady show that's fantastic. Let me, if I asked you, what would be the top thing? you would like for your magazine right now? The top thing at this moment? Yeah. Well, of course I would want to go to print if that would be the ultimate. Right. Um, leading to that, if I had to say right now, just to build a following that would attract the advertisers that I need. That's where I'm going working toward. Um, I, that's important. Uh, so, but ultimately it would be to go back to print and uh, we have an online version and a print version and that's what we would do. Okay. Well, everyone, you heard that, so make sure you follow 
and uh, sign up for their newsletter because that's what the lady's wanting. What? Well, we need a lot of support. We need we need support. We're, we're nobody without readers and um, people who are uh, actively involved on the on the on our Twitter. We're at Black Parenting One on all social media. Uh, because we're the first black parenting magazine in the nation. We can claim that. It's, it's wow. We have articles. You can see it on our, our archived articles from USA Today. We were in, um, we were on CNN at the time in the 90s because we were the first black publication. A couple months later, another one came out, um, but we were definitely the first and we can claim that. So. so if you have any competitors, what separates you from those competitors if you have any competitors in your same market? Well, we're talking about parents. I haven't seen um, necessarily, I mean, there are local ones that are out um, I, as far as national. There used to be um, another publication, I won't mention their name, uh, but the quality of the articles, um, there's research behind it, meaning that like uh, my partner, she is a research scientist at a major university. Okay. Um, okay. My background being early childhood education. Um, I've taught, you said I taught from early childhood to high school, but I actually taught at Hof Hofstra University too. Wow. So I went from um, preschool to, um, and I taught communications because of the publication, um, to college. So I had that background as a teacher, you know, as an educator, um, as a parent, as um, a single mom. So all of these experiences, uh, and then my children are successful, every single one of them. Uh, and it was hard. I always said it was like a war, to, the war against the world to make your child successful. And it really is like there's so many elements out there that can influence them that you have to fight to make sure and do whatever it takes to make sure. When I say whatever it takes, I mean, I'm not talking, don't, don't go crazy and like do crazy stuff, but like whatever it takes to, to make sure your child is safe. And the whole thing is about safety. I'm not saying beat your child or anything like that. Don't take my words out of context. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying you monitor your child. You be there for your child. You know where your child is. You know what's going on. If you can't figure it out, you find a way to figure out what's going on with your child. Because I had, uh, I remember my children, were, when they were teenagers, oh boy. Oh, <laughs> it was, I mean, you know, they want to sneak out the house and all that stuff. And we had a ranch home in Florida and I, I remember even saying, if she opens that window and tries to sneak out at night, I'm going to put a taxidermy type of alligator right under her window. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I'm that parent. I'm that parent. I would do that. Oh, I was wow. like, put it right under her window. So when oh, she wow. steps down, she's going to think she's stepping on the alligator or something. <laughs> I'm going to find something. And she's not going to ever do that again. Wow. And I, you know, I'm that one. I'm like, I'm a booby trap it with some pots and pans and, and a line across from the tree. So I hear all those pots and pans. She sneaks. I am that person, but she grew up, my, that particular one that I was worried about, grew up to be a fine woman and a an excellent mom. I want to choke up because she has an excellent mom. I love her to death. And uh, she has a master's degree in medical assistance. Uh, wow. So she is, she's, she's amazing. She married to, to a wonderful man who's a master artist and a school teacher. Uh, I can't ask for anything better, you know. One day, hopefully, her daughter will take this publication over and run with it. So for people, for people who I'm speaking are going to go to your online magazine, what should they expect when they go to your online magazine? What should they, what the experience, what, should, what are they going to see when they go to it online? There's a lot of things. We have a lot of different columns that are listed at the top. We have featured articles. Um, that we th their featured articles go with what's on like you see behind me the cover of the magazine for that month um, We have a family forum called the village where you can actually go and ask questions and other parents will answer them If they don't we will we're just building that up. So feel free to, to click on the button. that says the village um, You can you'll be able to, to see um, the, the recent articles you can go back and see the archived articles uh, there's about me, our stories on there. So if you, you know, didn't hear all of my story, you can go back and read about our story. You can read about our mission. You can read about how the magazine got started in the first place and where we are and what we're trying to do. Excellent. Has there been any content about black fathers raising oh, yeah. kids? Absolutely. And, 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 um, I, and what sort of perspective can you give on that? Because that, it's something that I know isn't a lot online, but since your magazine specializes in black parenting, can you give some insight on that from the pages of your magazine? Yeah, well, we have a column for dads. 
Uh, and we encourage dads to actually write for us. We've had a few write in and they're published under that. Uh, but yes, we, our previous, uh, our last, actual editor-in-chief before me but when we had the print magazine was a father you sent you jenkins so he was a dad and uh so we were like i think pretty unique to have a dad as a an editor-in-chief for a big parenting magazine and that's you know we want to be unique so yes we definitely um encourage the dad's perspective it's really important you know i was raised by my dad and um wow. you know I know how important it is to have a dad in the family. I was daddy's girl. You know, you can find my my dad without me when I was a, a toddler to a preschooler. I would always ride on his shoulders. Oh, um, wow. He would go, yes. I would grab my coat, <laughs> you know. So daddy's girl, I was, daddy was everything, you know. And to this day, I miss him so much. Um, but yeah, so I know how important it is to have a dad in the family. For me, it just, you know. Uh, didn't work out to have to be a married woman with my kid's dad around, but uh, you know they still have a close relationship with their dad today. Nice, nice, fantastic. There's so well, we'll, we'll start winding it down here because I know you've got a crazy schedule. And if you're telling me you're gonna you're up to midnight a lot of times, plus you're doing <laughs> stuff in the day, I want to make sure you conserve your energy. Let me ask in regards to parenting. Take Actually, here's a good question. Take your experience of how you were raised and compare it how you raised your daughters. Mm -hmm. What things did you learn from the way you were raised that were either the same or different on how you raised your daughters? That's an interesting perspective because sometimes you find yourself being your parents, and which is the weirdest thing in the world. Um, I, I, I think the difference was it, and it's, it's kind of hard to compare the two because I was raised with a, um, I was the oldest in my household. I had a half brother that did not live with me. And my youngest brother was um, a special needs. You know, he was challenged. He was a blue baby at birth. CPR hadn't come out and wow. uh, he didn't get oxygen to the brain. He was born normal, but then uh, the lack of oxygen um, hindered him. And he had, he couldn't really speak too well. You understood him can, can communicate now. He would get his point across, right. but he could, couldn't really speak in complete sentences. Um, but yeah, he was still my younger brother, so he's annoying. <laughs> so I love him to death, but he's annoying. And I took him places. I did wonderful things with him when I got older, but as he was growing up, he was just my younger brother. Um, so for me, I never had sisters. I never had really a sibling that I interacted with normally. Like the, I was always his caregiver or making sure he didn't get hurt or make sure no one hurt him because he didn't like have any kind of look to him that would make someone think, oh, so he's special. But you knew when he opened his mouth, he was, you know. So I was always protecting him. I remember taking him to Great Adventure, which is Six Flags in New Jersey. And, and me, you know, I'm, I'm like 17 or something like that. So I took him to, we were getting on the screen machine with a special needs. No, that wasn't a good idea. So I'm in line, I'm watching this. I'm like, if he falls off at this roller coaster, my mother is going to kill me. Let's get out of line. So I started to get out of line and he has a fit. And when I say a fit, like special needs fit. And so I'm like, oh my God, here we go. So finally I had to get him out of line, but he touches somebody that's really bulky, big dude, and the dude's ready to hit him because uh, I he didn't realize. And I'm like, and I just had to jump in front and be like, no, 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 he's special. You don't, don't do that. He can't. He didn't know any better. Sorry. And then, you know, th these are kind of things I dealt with. So uh, raising my daughters, uh, you know, I always wanted them to have this loving relationship because I even remember when my mom brought him home for the first time, she didn't know anything had happened. She found out later. The hospital never told her. They never sent her a bill. Wow. They just sent her home with a baby with issues. And um, her attending doctor was a friend of hers. He never said anything. And she didn't ever sue the hospital because that wasn't in vogue back then to sue hospitals. And, um, you know, that was something that they didn't, just didn't do. And even to do that, she would have had to sue her friend. So she never did it. And I think she, you know, after years, she might regret that a little bit. Um, but because she had to still raise him even when my father passed, which was really hard. But, uh, you know, my daughters, I mean, she brought him home, I was going to say. I wanted a sister. I was like, can you take him back? You know, I was that kid. Can you take him back to the hospital? 
And my mom, I remember my mom saying, don't you think he looks cute? I'm like, no, he looks like a turtle. <laughs> I remember this conversation like you were just saying, no, he looks like a turtle. But I was just, I was just a little kid, seven years old. So okay. I always wanted a sister. Now here I am, nothing but girls around me. There you, there you go. But they were two years apart each. They were doorsteps. So they didn't get along. And it killed me because I knew I wanted a sister so bad. I wanted them to have that relationship. But I thought I was going to have this fantasy in my head that you're going to love your sister. And you're going to be like, instead, it was the typical, don't touch me. She's touching me. Mom, she's in that room. Mom. You know, and I was like, and they're like, you know, I was like, oh, my God. And the little one was the tattletale. You know, the middle one's the mediator, just like the middle kid. Yep. And the oldest one, she got along with the middle one, but not the youngest one. I remember the youngest one standing over the oldest one while she was taking a nap with scissors ready to cut her hair. Oh, no. I mean, <laughs> there's all kinds of things going on, you know? Wow. So this relationship between them really boggled my mind. <laughs> I couldn't understand it's, it. It's boggling my <laughs> mind just listening to it. When they got older, I said, you know, the only thing I ever want, I said, God forbid something happens to me, the only thing I ever want is you guys to take care of each other and be, you know, always be loving. And now they are. They really are. Um, they are really good to each other. And, uh, you know, they're what I had imagined they should have been back then, now. So I'm really proud of them. I can't tell you, like, each one of them, they are very successful. And as a parent, all I wanted was for them to be more successful than me. And every single one of them really are. They are. And, um, you know, in my wildest dreams, I wouldn't guess my youngest would have been a model because who knew she would be tall enough. Even though at three years old, I used to say, hey, no, she's my little supermodel. And the reason I did that was because she's very dark skin. Yeah. So her sisters are lighter and they would tease her about her skin. And she had eczema, too. And oh she became a model with the eczema too. Wow. So I would say, no, 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 you're about, you're my, you're gorgeous. Actually, I would say, I would play with her and say that you're gaseous. I don't know, that's our little word. We yeah. still do that today. And I said, and you're gonna be. And I said, you mommy's little supermodel. Don't you listen to anybody, you know? And I was telling her that over and over again. And then who knew she was gonna be tall enough to even be a model? Um, she hit twelve. She was five ten, five ten. And she's just beautiful. And everywhere we went, everyone would ask her, she's a model, she's a model. And I was like, well, maybe you should be a model. And then when the time came and she really wanted to be a model, I told her no, because I was a single parent. We were in Florida. Got to drive everywhere. I can't do that. I got to work. I got to stay. You know, I can't be driving all over the state. Right. And uh, we went, so uh, her story is we went to a, um, a, a, one of those radio stations had a casting call yep. for yep. a modeling camp. And we went there, and everybody knew she was going to get picked. She got picked for the first round. Second round, they didn't even see her walk across the stage. They were still writing from the previous girl that went across. And I asked, can she go again? Because I've watched them not hold their head up until she was off the stage. So I said, hey, can she go again? And they told me no. So I said, okay. And then she didn't get picked, and she was crushed. And so I said, okay, well, I'm going to take you and do this myself. So we went to a couple of agencies in Florida, and they all said, you got to take her to New York. She would do great. So I was just ending my job pretty much at the YMCA, being the executive director. And I said, I knew that job was coming to an end at that time because I just was having a personality clash with one of the new vice presidents. So I said, okay, it's time. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, how that happens. So took a vacation. We went to New York. <coughs> and um, that's that history after that. She got picked and I sold my house and took her up there. Because I knew this was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And little did I know how much stuff she would do. I mean, she was the muse of one of the top photographers in the world. She did Vogue magazine cover. She did Victoria's Secret several, two years in a row, walking. Um, she's been in every magazine just about out there. She's walked for every designer in the world except for Chanel and Versace. Those are the two that eluded her. Um, but every you name it up, anything else, she's pretty much walked for them. And um, she's just done really well for herself. Well, congratulations on her Thank success. Thank you. As we wind down our epic conversation, I have a two-part question for you. Maybe three, right. but it's a two-part, same question, two parts. What is your message when it comes to parenting for black men? For black men, just always, always make sure that you are there for them. Don't discriminate with girls or boys, like what you do with them. Um, my dad at first tried to keep me out of his tools, you know, because I was a girl. And I'm very hands-on to this day, very mechanically inclined. 
Um, I, at the time, I would, at one time there, I tried to get into the Navy and I had the highest score on the mechanical part of the test in that area, they said, for a female. Um, so, you know, he would tell me all the time, stay out of my tools, stay out of my tools, him being a mechanic, you know, and I would still show him stuff that I made, you know, like, look what I made today, Dad. He would say, how did you drill that hole? And I would say, uh-oh, busted. <laughs> you know, but, so don't discriminate because you have a girl. I think you can't do the same things that you do with your boy that you do with your girl or want a boy so bad because you can't do what you want to do with your girl. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. We're talking STEM and all this stuff now because of that. Let your girls treat them the same way. Teach them mechanics. Play baseball with them. Take them out. It's not going to change who they are. You need to take them and do that. So that's my message to dads. Be there for your girls and be there for your boys, but don't discriminate against your girls because they're a girl. I mean, when they get to be a certain age, they're not going to want to do that anyway. But while they want to learn from you, be that person because they're going to look to um, whatever you do for them uh, in the man that they end up getting. That man cannot be less than you in what you do for them. If that man is less than you, they're not going to accept them. So you're giving them kind of the bar to reach. So you need to be there for them. What is your message when it comes to black parenting to black mothers? Well, to black moms, you know, we're like sometimes like the pit bulls of the family. Make sure that um, no harm comes to our kids. Nobody messes with our kids. I'm going to say just make sure that you do that in the school systems as well. Like you need to be there. Show up for those meetings. I know some of us work two, three jobs, but we got to be there for the meeting, if you're, or even if you're there for five minutes. But this is what I recommend the most. And dads can do this, too, so there's no discrimination here. You can uh, use FaceTime. If you tell your, or Skype, like we're doing now, you can tell your teacher, hey, I want to Skype you once a week. I want to FaceTime you once a week. Use this new technology um, and say, hey, at this time, can I, can I Skype you? Can I FaceTime you after school? Uh, and, and do that. You'd be surprised how many teachers would be willing and open to do that. And that way you can see face-to-face. Um, it's not just a, a, an email going back and forth. And if they do email you, respond and make sure they have your current email. Because it's to make sure our, our children are successful, it takes um, a relationship with the teachers. You need to know what these teachers think, what they're like, um, how they're teaching your children. Uh, if your child says they don't get along with a teacher, investigate that. Trust your child for the most part. Go check it out. I'm not saying teachers are bad, but, you know, go check it out because, you know, there may not uh, be a good relationship between you and your, your child and the teacher. It may be a personality clash, maybe something, but you need to be there to find out. And that's my, my advice. And it can go both ways, parent with dads as well as moms. One last conversation piece for you. Sure. What is your biggest concern and your biggest hope when it comes to black parenting? I want to see our children grow up and make this world better. Sounds like something from a pageant, right? I want world peace. No, I want to see, I want our children to, to they, unfortunately, they're going to have to fix this world for us. This generation of some people have messed up this world. Like, you know, you can see it. Like the environment is going bad. The the, there are animals that are going extinct. It probably didn't have to because of man. There's all kinds of things that are going on. I, I need our, our children to be the leaders for the next generation. I need them to make a difference in this world. And in order to do that, they have to be 10 times better than the next person. And you know what I'm saying? They have to be because you know, I saw this meme about, and I don't want to get into politics, but what Obama is, you know, he's a Harvard graduate. He's this, he's that. And then you see our current president and like, mm, no comparisons, night and day, you know, but the qualifications and where they went to school and things that they did. So you got to be 10 times better a lot of times to be even looked at or accepted, but do it for you. Don't do it for that reason. Do it for yourself. Tell your kids they can be great. Tell them they are great. Tell them that they 
they are going to be awesome when they grow up, that you're looking forward to seeing them grow up, that you're happy that, that you're their parents, that you're happy, you're, you feel so blessed that you're their mom, that you're their dad. Let them hear you say those good things. Talk about them on a the phone and make sure they're in hearing distance and say how much you care for them and how much, how proud you are of them, where they don't think that you know they hear you. So those little things, they all count to build their self-esteem so they can do anything. And you'll be surprised how far they go. You really will. Well, that is it. Is anything else you'd like to share with us other than the contact information for the magazine? Anything else you'd like to share with us? Well, I can just tell you it was a joy talking to you today. That's for sure. Thank you. Uh, we have a lot of new articles. If you want, if you're interested in, in writing for us, you don't have to be the best writer in the world. I'm good at editing. So just, you know, if you're interested in doing it, you're a parent. Um, go to the top of our website at SuccessfulBlackParenting.com and you will see writer's guidelines and an editorial calendar. So you can see what kind of topics we're going to be doing um, for the rest of the year, as well as our columns and what we're looking for. So look there. It'll tell you how many words as well. And um, just submit it to our website. You'll see the contact information to do that. Is, it was on there on the side. And um, please follow us on all social media. Right now, my focus is Twitter. And um, once I get, um, I have a goal of 10,000 followers on Twitter first. And That's a very important number. We will discuss that offline. Uh, okay. Yeah, 10,000 on Twitter. And then I'm going to go to Instagram. And then I will be also working on Facebook. Um, after that, and then I'm going to cycle back around to Twitter. So since I'm a one man band, pretty much, except for Martha, Martha is always there, but I'm doing this, the social media all by myself. So I'm going to be cycling back around, uh, to, uh, Twitter again, once I, I get the goal of my followers for each of those, uh, platforms. Wonderful. Janice, thank you for taking the time out of your positive, productive schedule for what thank you're you. doing professionally what you're doing with your family and also with the magazine it's appreciated and not taken for granted we will share the contact information on the post that will have the replay of this epic conversation my name is dr vibe i'm host and producer of the award-winning dr vibe show i'm also a certified empowerment coach and president and ceo of express your vibe coaching and communications if you want to watch a replay of an epic conversation like this on youtube go to youtube put in the search engine the space dr period space B-I-B-E space S-H-O-W. If you want to listen to audio replays of my epic conversations, you can go to the website address, the D-R-V-I-B-E-S-H-O-W dot com. You can also go to Apple, um, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, Tuned In Radio, Google Play Music Store, and iHeartRadio. You can also hear selected audio replays at thegoodmenproject.com. Also, you can listen to selected replays at wjmsradio.com. Also know I'm a brand ambassador for the only online magazine dedicated to African Americans in food, wine, and travel. The name of the magazine is called Cuisine Noir magazine. The website address is cuisinoirmag.com. Also know I am a I provide a service called Getting Media Coverage, where I help businesses and entrepreneurs get media promotion and coverage so they can elevate their business. So if you want to touch base with me on that, you can catch touch base with me via Twitter at drvibeshow. Email me dr period vibe at the drvibeshow.com, and also go to the, my website put on click on contact dr vibe show and we can make that happen same drill if you want to set up a complimentary 30-minute empowerment session finally you can catch me via philadelphia like Jan where janice is from on, right. on friday mornings <laughs> at 7 25 a.m eastern time i'm one of the panelists on the weekly segment of the week that was which is hosted by christopher flood the drummer norris wurd is the only independently owned black talk radio station in the state of Pennsylvania. They are on AM, FM, and online, and the radio station's been around for a long time. So they are doing some good stuff. So finally, I'd like to share three things. First of all, live your life as a dream. If you can dream it, you can make it. Next up, sometimes you have to get smaller to get stronger. So I'd like to say thank you for watching this live and on the replay. God bless. Peace be well. Keep the faith. And we always appreciate your support and don't take it for granted. God bless and good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. What is up, everybody? It's Dr. Vibe here, host and producer of the award-winning The Dr. Vibe Show. I have hosted and produced over 2,000 
epic conversations over the last 10 years. And what makes our conversations epic? We don't do interviews. We do conversations.